any cold, lazy Monday. <laughs> but it's about to get way better because I'm super delighted to introduce Gregory. Well, maybe we'll break with tradition and have you pronounce your own name. Yeah, that's not stuff. Okay, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Gregory did his, is a new assistant professor here in computer science. He did his PhD at the Pennsylvania State University. Um, and he was a postdoc uh, for a while at Brown and then a postdoc at that other university at Pennsylvania, <laughs> University of Pennsylvania. And uh, so now he's here and we're super, I'm super excited to see his talk on uh, what's new in big data theory. Oh, thanks a lot. Um, all right, great, we're all set. And before we start, a couple of disclaimers um, about the title. So, so this talk definitely does not claim to tell you everything that's new in VDD theory, uh, just some sample of it, a bias sample. And also, theory has this informal name that we use for theoretical computer science because we're too lazy to, to say the full thing, just call it theory. Um, so the full title uh, should read what's new in the big data theoretical computer science. Okay, great. And let's get started. Uh, so this talk will have two different levels, maybe even more than two. So one level is going to be sort of a very high level to give you the general idea of what kind of things we care about. And then we're going to move on pretty fast into more technical stuff. Um, so I hope that, you know, at least a general thing will catch, catch on with everyone, and then the more technical stuff, uh, please feel free to stop me and interrupt if something is unclear. But if, you know, at some point you get lost, this is actually somewhat expected. Um, all right. So big data is a sort of a buzzword, which is fairly popular, among, especially among non-experts in media, who can mean all sorts of things when they're talking about big data, if you read about big data in the news. You can see all sorts of things. And you know, for general public, big data usually means something like a lot of spreadsheets. Whenever you know the way big data does not fit into one spreadsheet, it's already big, hard to handle. Have a lot of medical data, uh, or any other kind of data, messy data. A lot of the nice media is just gonna go call it big data right away. And in fact, there is even a band called Big Data. Some people think that this is what Big Data means. Uh, it's a really popular band, actually, based in Brooklyn. And yeah, they're pretty viral. Uh, you can check them on YouTube. All right, so, um, but again, okay, let's try to move on from sort of the very non-technical definition of Big Data towards something more technical. And if you talk to more technical people, say business experts, analysts, data scientists, and et cetera, then we're going to start to hear something more specific about what big data actually means. And this crowd came up with four words to describe what big data is. Um, initially it was three, the three Bs of big data. Later on it became four Bs. Maybe, you know, the sock is in the wall. Maybe these data are five, six, or I don't know how many Bs out there to describe what big data is. But the, the key ones are volume, velocity, and variety. The size of your data, how fast it it is coming at you, uh, variety is how, how many different kind of types of records you have, that sort of stuff. Uh, and veracity is a new one um, that is kind of similar to variety actually, but oh well. Now, also if you talk more specifically to people who consider themselves as doing big data, you know, in an industry, uh, they're gonna show you a whole bunch of other words that go together with big data, probably, you know, when you think of big data, you think of big databases. Uh, you think of some statistics that you're doing on this big data uh, to analyze it. You're doing cloud computing to compute stuff when the data is big. Um, machine learning, privacy concerns arise in big data pretty often, and so on and so on. So there are all sorts of things which connect to big data in all sorts of ways. But for myself, because I do algorithms research and I would like to have a technical definition of what big data really means, I like to use the following definition of big data that makes it really technical and very specific so that you don't get lost in, in, in you know, all these buzzwords. All right, so uh, my personal favorite definition of big data is data that doesn't fit into your random access memory. So if your data fits into random access memory, then it's not a big data. And uh, and the rise of big data is actually, you know, corresponds to actual real phenomenon. 
something that we have not seen before, uh, which is access to cloud services. And I'm going to talk about this more specifically, but this is some picture of a cloud. Uh, could have been Spark, uh, very popular cloud computing frameworks that everyone can use. Clouds are now available very easily to everyone. You can just go and sign up, you know, on, uh, for Amazon EC2 or, or Google Compute Engine. I'm going to talk about this a little later on. Um, another popular framework that maybe is a little less known is Apache Storm. So this is um, used most by finance people when you're processing streaming data that is coming at you really, really fast. Remember the velocity in, in big data is, is, is one of the Vs and Storm addresses velocity. And so, um, yeah, I'm going to mention this class of N uh, where, you know, we looked at the algorithms that can be used in, in all these sort of scenarios. So if you want to actually dig in deeper, check out uh, the homepage for this class and there is going to be a bunch of references to the literature. All right, so, um, and because I personally work on algorithms, I like to design algorithms that are really, really fast. Um, I also want to point out that big data is not just a quantitative challenge. It's not just, you know, the size of data became a little bigger and, and everything became a little slower uh, and, and that's about it. But it's actually a fundamental challenge, so it is actually qualitative rather than quantitative. And so we actually need completely new algorithms for a lot of problems that we thought were nice and tame and tractable. So if your data fits into RAM, I want to say that you have decades of previous work. And uh, it's really true. There is a whole bunch of textbooks that give you all the nitty gritty details of all sorts of algorithms. I'm not sure if you can see, but this is the Donald Knott series of textbooks, uh, CLRS, a whole bunch of other algorithms textbooks, and they really are fantastic if your data fits into RAM. You can compute all sorts of things. And um, yeah, some breaking rights, uh, some of my work uh, before I said grad school is cited uh, in Donald Knott's Volume 4 that just came out last year or so. Um, and so this is all great, but uh, if your data doesn't fit into RAM, then a lot of these algorithms from these textbooks that have been optimized for many, many years, they break down. And they break down because um, you cannot just put together a bunch of sticks of RAM and hope that now your RAM is, is big enough and everything fits because this is not how systems architecture works. You cannot just scale random access memory infinitely by, by just putting sticks together and hope that you get a bigger RAM size. So, um, uh, so we're gonna talk about you know, how it actually works if you wanna compute on big data, uh, but, but the RAM size is really a very important quantity here. Uh, from the user's perspective, it's just a simple user, then uh, from your perspective, it's also an interesting phenomenon that happened in the last, let's say, five or so years um, that previously maybe you were computing on your local cloud very often. You would go to, you know, your university's cloud and, and try to compute on your local cluster. But now you have another option available, which is often better and simpler to use than going to your local cluster and trying to compute something there. And, and this option, um, I mentioned it before, is a public cloud. And uh, it's used both by businesses. I think it's particularly suitable for researchers uh, because if you don't want to buy or a, an expensive cluster or try to fight for access on your local cluster that sometimes is difficult to get, uh, then you can just go to public cloud and, 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 and and use it for your purposes. So, um, so the two main options here that I'm aware of, uh, so unfortunately, I guess the bottom of my slide is cut out a bit, uh, so um, I'll just try to say what's we in there. Uh, so one, one of the option is Amazon EC2. You know, it's been around for, for the longest time, and I think it's the, uh, the main baseline solution that most of the businesses use, um, and most researchers use. Uh, there is this new competitor, Google Compute Engine. So you cannot see the name, but this is uh, the logo of uh, Google Compute Engine that I personally really like. 
Um, it's a new newcomer to this game of big data computing. They offer better pricings and in my opinion, much better friendly user interface. So from user's perspective, I would highly recommend checking them out. And uh, as I mentioned, there are all these frameworks that have been created in the last seven years uh, that you can run on top of these services, right? So the way it works, you rent a bunch of machines from one of these two, say, or there are other cloud providers as well. And then you typically run Hadoop or Spark or Storm if you're dealing with streaming data. Um, uh, on top of your cluster. Wait. Everything good so far? Okay, good. Um, all right, and now let's move on to, to sort of the business perspective. And it also matches the user's perspective a little bit. You know, once, once you start dealing with cloud services, one of the first things that you notice is that you have to pay for them. And um, you get some basic trials to, to play with that, they're pretty good for getting started, but eventually if you want to actually do some serious computation, you're going to pay for your computing services. And um, I just did some analysis, the, the most basic vanilla analysis you can do of the pricings, and the first thing that caught my attention was that the amount of money that you pay, it Scales, scales basically linearly with the amount of space and time that you use. So, so the most basic computation that I did here, so I just tried Google Compute Engine, uh, which I think is, is cheaper than Amazon EC2, and I tried to rent um, a bunch of instances, a bunch of basic machines from it. Uh, so here's a hundred, here's a thousand, here's ten thousand. And if I'm trying to run a hundred machines, a year, then I'm paying $5,000 if I'm just running them for the entire year. That seems pretty good deal, right? So you're renting uh, 100 of these really basic machines. So these machines are not exactly great. Probably, you know, if you're actually doing this, you're not renting the, the micros, but you, you, you're renting something more sophisticated, so you're actually paying more. But, you know, let's, let's do this experiment with micros. And um, um, if I scale a uh, 100 times, if I need for my algorithm, say, 10,000 uh, 10, machines just to accommodate the space usage or, or the time usage, one of these two, then I end up paying basically 100 times more. And uh, there is really not much of an economy of scale here, which kind of surprised me a little bit, uh, but that's the way it is. So if you're buying, you know, 100 times more resources, you're just paying 100 times more. That's a pretty basic calculation. And, and this really gives you a direct incentive to try and optimize your algorithms now. Because, you know, maybe you took your introduction to algorithms, algorithms 101, and you kind of been sitting there and like uh, phasing out for a moment. Because maybe your professor is talking about these algorithms, the analysis of their space and time complexity, and it seems like, you know, maybe you can just make them a little slower and be okay with that, right? Uh, but here there is this direct incentive. If your algorithm is just twice slower, then you pay in twice more money. And this, this is not just about you waiting, you know, twice longer or something like that. You're paying twice more money. Uh, and this is really a direct incentive to think really carefully about how efficient your algorithms are. Uh, all right. And this calculation is really um, only including the cost of, of the computing resources. You just bind the machines. But then you will have to install some framework and run all the software uh, on your own. Uh, you have to pay even a lot more on top of it, and there are various different pricing schemas available um, if you're using provided algorithms. So if you don't deploy your own algorithms, you're using, say, Amazon EC2 machine learning platform, then um, actually your pricing is just going to skyrocket. It's um, going to depend on how many times do you need uh, to perform your classification problem? And like for every time um, you need to classify stuff, you're paying um, Amazon money. All right. Huh? Okay. <laughs> Good. Um, uh, so, okay. So, um, so, so this is the basic introduction and the motivation for why should we care about efficiency when we do cloud computing. Right? So, so this was all just to motivate the fact that when, when you move into the cloud, you should care about the efficiency of your algorithms a lot more than you typically do. 
Like if you're just using your laptop, maybe you care less. But when you move to the cloud, you should care more because of all these money considerations uh, involved. And so to characterize the complexity of the algorithms, you also have to do more work because now your system is actually quite sophisticated. Um, I assume most of you, you know, are pretty good at programming your own laptop. You can write some algorithms, run on it. But when you move on to the cloud, then things get more sophisticated. And uh, from my perspective, I do algorithms. So uh, what I want to do is uh, I want to understand the complexity of algorithms, like we do in algorithms 101, when we analyze, say, sorting, uh, but for, for these algorithms which run in the cloud. OK. And so um, here's a basic breakdown of the two things uh, which are the main bottlenecks and which are going to eat your resources, time, and space. Um, so one is the total CPU time that you're using. And this basically responds to the computational complexity of your problem. And the other one is the network time that you're using because now your data is distributed between these identical machines, which you here on racks, uh, a lot of them. And so they're going to have to communicate to each other through the network. And this is a major bottleneck. And uh, this is going to be modeled through the lens of information and communication complexity. So how much information has to be exchanged between these machines in order to finish off the computation that we want to do. Okay. There are going to be two main ingredients. And uh, to make them more personal, um, let's associate them with these two famous computer scientists. One is Alan Turing, the founder of uh, computational complexity. And the other one is Claude Shannon, the founder of modern information theory and communication complexity. So uh, for the purposes of this talk, what happens in, in cloud computing can be analyzed through the tools developed by these two people. Uh, and, you know, some extensions definitely involved with that. And so we're going to be... Uh, now moving on to the technical part, um, and the technical part is going to be broken down into two pieces um, to, to make our introduction into cloud computing a little bit more gradual. We're first going to talk about some modern results uh, in communication complexity alone without focus on computation. And then we're going to introduce the, uh, the full picture. Uh, by combining the analysis of both computational and communication complexity together. Um, and so here we're going to establish some general theory of round versus communication trade-offs. Here we're going to look actually at some more specific problems. We're not going to solve the, the whole thing, uh, but uh, we're going to look at some problems which are particularly interesting, say, for applications in vision. And we're going to look at clustering and matching problems in, in multidimensional data. Okay. All right. So moving on to the technical part, he is our main hero for, for the first part. This is Alice. Uh, in theory, we'll often like to have these characters, Alice and Bob. So, so this one of them, Alice. Uh, but the second character is different now. It's a club. And so, so Alice is really excited. She got her new fancy cloud. And uh, this is called Alice in Cloudland. Um, so we're going to look at some basic vanilla problem first to, to illustrate some basic ideas of what happens um, between Alice and the cloud um, on some pretty toy example. And the, the problem that we're going to address is checking consistency of a file system in data storage. So imagine what Alice does with the cloud. It's basically roughly what Dropbox does. So Alice has a bunch of files, one, two, three, four, and your files are backed up in the cloud. So the, these are the same files. This copy of file 1, file 2, 3, and 4. And if you're using Dropbox, then if your files are unchanged, then everything is great. All the files are more green. And they are the same both in the local and in the remote version. Right? But every once in a while, something changes. And we're going to consider a fairly general setup, maybe even more general than necessary here. Uh, specifically, only Alice is changing files, but we're also going to be able to handle the situation when maybe something happens in the cloud and the cloud some philosophies of a file, something like that. Okay. Um, so this is what happens. You know, if you're using Dropbox, you see this quite a bit. When you change a file, you get this red X, and a synchronization has to happen. And so um, we're looking at sort of a very, very, very basic toy problem. Uh, 
which is, uh, suppose, you know, you, you don't have much control over this system. So the files can change uh, and, and you don't have like a nice client running that is keeping track of all this. You just want to know which files uh, have been changed on, on one of the systems. Um, so we'll have like a very simple solution that you can implement without run, running any clients on LSS side or on the cloud side. Okay, so um, so imagine we just want to track uh, which files are sent like this or which files have changed like this or like this. So the way we would go about this is we would have to have one of the parties, say Alice, um, send some messages to the cloud. So Alice is going to look into her file system and send some messages to the cloud so, so that the cloud can learn which files have changed and have to be synchronized. And we want the most basic protocol here, so it will only allow Alice to send one big message um, and the message combines information about all the files. So this is really one message that is going to go from Alice um, to the cloud. That's good. All right. And so the most naive approach to this problem is to use hashing. So I believe you know this is something you must have seen before. And um, this vanilla approach says. Let's just take a hash of each individual file, say, take an MD5 hash, and you're sending these hashes to the cloud, one hash per file. And if the hashes match, then great, you assume the files are equal. If the hashes don't match, then you clearly know that they are different. Okay. So in this case, uh, what we want to happen is that um, Whenever the files are different, the hashes don't match. So clearly, whenever the files are the same, hashes will turn out to be the same. You can put an MD5 you know, here and here, and, and they turn out the same. But if the files are different, then we want the hashes to be different. And this really has something to do with the length of the hash. If you take an MD5 that is really too short, then every once in a while on different files, the MD5 is going to collide. Right? And you're going to end up with the same hash, even though the files are different. If you just take, say, one bit hash, so there's zero and one, and uh, you, know, you only compress information down to one bit, so you're going to end up with collisions. And so there is certainly some trade-off here between how long is your hash versus how successful your hash is at distinguishing files. Right? OK. And uh, so if the hash is too short, then the hashes are going to collide in different files. That's a problem. And a hash collision is this event when the two files are actually different, but their hashes turn out to be the same. Right? This is a bad event. We don't want our hashes to collide on different files. OK. Yes, hash collisions. All right, good. And so here's a basic question that I want to ask you. Um, so imagine all I want is for a file system, say ext4, that has maximum of 232 files, we can assume that we indeed have 232 files. Um, in cloud services, the file systems can get pretty big pretty fast. Um, how long should the hashes be if you want to check consistency? If the requirement is, I want the overall success probability 50%. So I'm just sending all these hashes, and I want, in every situation when the two files are different, the hashes to not collide. But overall, you know, if this overall guarantee holds about say 50% chance, I'm happy. So let's try to think about this for a moment. Any guesses, you know, there are no no wrong answers. Um, when you're trying to guess, yeah. Wait, so is the question? So the question is that how long should each of the hashes be? We have two to thirty-two files. Right. So what else does? Okay. Uh, she, she, she sends one hash per file. Okay. Yeah. Right. And right. Uh, the question is how long should this hash be? Right. I mean, I, I would just put an upper or below. Uh, I don't know which bound I should say, but like at least thirty-two bits. Good. Maybe lower if we can do it six. Bits. At least uh, thirty-two is correct. Um, 
but at most what? Most. So we actually what we want is actually at most, right? Because you know. Yeah. Right. But but yeah, that's pretty close. Yeah. Um, I'll let you thirty to answer. All right. Well, the correct answer is actually thirty three. <laughs> so that was pretty close. <laughs> um, so why thirty three? Because um, if I'm sending thirty three bit signatures. Then for, for every pair, and we have 2 to the 32 pairs, uh, the probability of collision is 1 over 2 to the 33. Right, so imagine I'm doing one bet, right? So I have two different files with the probability that my two, two hashes collide. So two random variables which are independent, and the probability they collide is they either both 0 or both 1, probability 1 half. For, for 33 bit hashes, it's 1 over 2 to the 33. So the gist of it. There isn't much more. But, okay. Um, great. And so, so now 1 over 2 to the 33 is the probability of a hash collision. We have 2 to the 32 files. So the overall probability of something bad happening is 2 to the 32 uh, times 1 over 2 to the 33, which equals 1 half. Okay. That's so good. All right, great. So, uh, so this is a basic solution that is based on hashing to check files for quality. And just generalizing sort of this idea slightly, uh, if you have k files and two 32 files, then the answer is log k. And in general, we want higher success probability than 50%. If you wanted, um, you know, 50% success probability will be log k plus one. But if you want to see 99% success probability, then there's gonna be a little bit over high. We, you need to wait just adding a few extra bits to boost the success probability. Okay. So, and this is a sort of guarantee that we want in practice. Maybe we want 99.999 or something like that. Uh, so it basically never fails, right? Still, other log k bit hashes are good enough for us. All right, so, so this is a basic solution that involves just Alice sending one hash per, per file, and it involves communication of order log k bits per file if you have k, k files. So that's, um, that's just about. And um, in fact, one round communication and one round means that it's only one party, say Alice, in this case, party is symmetric, doesn't matter, uh, is sending messages to Bob. Um, in this one round communication, the, the entire theory of communication is very well understood. Um, so in fact, there was this previous work by Nissan, Kramer, and Ron that says if all you care about is, say, some constant success probability, like 99%, then there is this quantity, the VC dimension of the communication matrix of the problem that I'm not telling you about what it is, but there is some well-defined quantity uh, that is fairly easy to understand and compute. You look at that and you know exactly how many bits you need to send. Okay? Um, and this is unconditionally optimal. You know, no one can do better. So uh, that's basically the, the final answer to this problem if you only uh, want a 99% uh, success probability. Sometimes you want success probability that is parameterized and, and really you really want to reveal the one minus delta, uh, where delta is really, really small, um, less than any constant. And, you know, joint work with Molinar and Budroff, we show that uh, there is another quantity called packet numbers that is also fairly easy to understand and compute that characterizes one way communication. Okay, so this is basically um, almost a final answer to, um, to the one round communication problem. Uh, there was one little caveat that I just want to highlight here. If the inputs are independently distributed. Okay. So if, if you sort of assume that the changes that happen to the files happen independently. Uh, that's a bit of an assumption. Um, now the next chapter is what happens if Alice and Cloud can actually talk back and forth? Right, so Alice is sending some messages to the cloud, then the cloud replies back, and then we're sending these messages back and forth. And uh, ideally, we want this number of rounds of interaction to be small. 
uh, for all sorts of practical considerations because every run typically comes with some overhead and some delays because you need to wait for the run to complete uh, and, and you cannot start a new run until your previous round is over and, and there is usually uh, some overhead in doing this. So typically we don't want to have too many rounds of communication. And that's a fairly new phenomenon studied in the field of communication complexity, motivated by all these practical considerations in distributed computing. Um, so the interesting fact is that even just with two rounds, you can already dramatically reduce the amount of communication for this file synchronization problem. Um, so if you just allow the cloud to reply back to Alice, then Communication per file is going to go down from other log k bits down to log log k bits. So that's already non trivial savings. If your k is large, that can be substantial. Uh, sorry for, for cutting out uh, the one on this slide, but um, uh, if you have r rounds of talking back and forth, then basically the communication per file scales roughly as you're taking log 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 log, log r times of k. And this communication profile. So, say in R iterated log of k, you get down to constant communication profile that's independent of k. So, so the end of the story basically is that if you want to reduce the communication down to the theoretically possible optimum, so the optimum is really like constant number of best profile, you can do better than that, then it suffices to have a very small number of rounds of interaction. Basically, iterative log is a constant, so it's just a constant number of rounds of interaction, it's going to be good enough. Okay. So, moreover, the, the good news is that uh, this is also optimal. It's not just, you know, some upper bound that achieves this result, but you also have unconditional lower bounds that say that you cannot do better. Um, so we have one paper that shows that for one round of communication you cannot have better, and we have another paper that shows that for R rounds of communication you also cannot asymptotically improve on this result. And uh, in case some of you got too excited and you want to go start a company that does that, be, be, beware, you know, we just recently actually got this patent finally fully approved. So um, don't get sued by IBM. Don't, don't start a company that does this for profit. All right. Okay. I know if someone left the room, maybe they, they wanted to start a company for profit and they will never learn this patent. <laughs> well, please make sure you tell them. Um, all right, so, so what's new here? So the, the real new thing here in theory is the focus on the number of rounds of communication because there's been a lot of previous work that was talking about communication back and forth, uh, but the number of rounds of communication was not really limited. So and in that setup, uh, the theory has been well developed before us, so there wasn't much left to do. And uh, now we're going to increase the level of abstraction a little bit. Uh, and the checking equivalence of the file system problem can really be seen as a set intersection problem. So if Alice and Bob want to figure out which of the files are the same and which are different, then what, what they really want to learn is the intersection between the two data sets that they have. So you can actually formally map this onto an abstract set intersection problem by thinking of each file as an element in a really, really large universe. So Alice and Cloud really want to know what is the intersection between their two sets of data. And uh, if you want to dig in into theory literature around this, so here are the relevant terms. The decision version of this problem, where the only thing you want to know is one bit. Has been there been a change or has there been no change? Um, this is called the decision version. Do they intersect or not? So that's called set disjunctness problem which is a really fundamental problem in communication complexity, and the previous work focuses on communication, as I mentioned, with unbounded number of rounds of communication back and forth, and this is really one of the most fundamental results in uh, the entire field of theoretical computer science. Um, it, and uh, this paper by Federico Shalevis and Arnison showed that 
with other login runs, uh, you can get down to order one communication profile. But these guys do not really care about number of runs. It's just a side effect that you know the number of runs is, is not terrible, but it's also not optimal in their work. So our work actually does show that log star, which is basically for all practical purposes a constant number of runs, uh, suffices to get down to order one communication profile. All right, so logarithm versus order one it, it is quite a substantial improvement. And uh, moreover, this uh, result is famously complemented by, by the lower bound from set disjointness, uh, just this decision version already does require uh, order one communication profile, um, and this is optimal and this is a very celebrated result in communication complexity. All right, so now let me describe a whole bunch of applications that follow from um, all these line of papers that we have developed, uh, and uh, that is going to connect to a whole bunch of applications. All right, so um, so as I mentioned, this file consistency problem can be also modeled theoretically as a set intersection problem. So okay, so now we finally have this abstract notation. Uh, where we have two, two sets, S and T. So S corresponds to, to the set that L says, T corresponds to the set that Bob has, and T sets, they live in some really big universe of size N. And so what we know is that K, say the number of files, uh, is basically just a bound on the size of the sizes, how many items you have on each side. And uh, the question is, can we compute an intersection, right? Um, so oftentimes, uh, we also want to compute something else, rather than an intersection that is actually closely related to the intersection. So one popular statistic that is, um, and here is used a lot, for example, in, in natural language processing to compare tax documents embedded into, uh, uh, into high-dimensional vectors, or dimension n, uh, is the statistic called Jacquardi index, or Jacquardi similarity. Uh, so the current similarity of two documents would be uh, the size of the intersection divided by the size of the union of the two sets that you have, right? So you have two documents, you map them into vectors, or each vector says uh, which words are present in, in one document and the other document, and then you want to compute similarity, right? Then you compute in this Jacquard index, and uh, this is also another very celebrated result in, in theoretic computer science, in algorithms specifically, uh, mean hash. So Broder invented mean hash in 98, and it's been refined in all kinds of ways. Um, and the key observation of Broder is that he computed mean hash approximately with one plus minus epsilon error. And then there is this really clever idea that Broder had developed for Google to compute mean hash on, on tax documents. Um, so in our case, um, we were able to do better than this approximation of one plus minus epsilon by broader because we can compute Jacquard index exactly, right? So we're going to tell you what is the intersection, so you can figure out what is the size of the intersection divided by the size of the union, and, and you get your Jacquard index exactly rather than approximately from mean hash. Um, okay. And another interesting observation here is that the intersection function, if you want to know common elements in your sets, is actually quite different from other set theoretic functions. Uh, for example, if you want to compute the union uh, of the two sets which live on else's machine and in the cloud, uh, this is S union T, or the symmetric difference between them. Symmetric difference is uh, the files which are either only present on else's machine or only in the cloud machine then both of those actually do not exhibit any run versus communication trade-offs. Um, so you cannot do anything basically better than this bond that actually is basically the name bond. Uh, you cannot be this uh, by, by trying to run multiple runs. So this will be achieved in just one round of communication by the trivial algorithm. And so does the rationale, um, the sort of the high-level intuition for why intersection is really different from these guys is that um, Intersection is really contained by both players. So both Alice and the cloud know, the, you know, they have these items from the intersection. They just have to rule out the rest. While in these two cases, what you want to compute actually does not really depend on the items contained by the other player. 
right? So if you want to know the union, you really want to figure out what are the items that you have missing. And that is harder to do. That requires more communication than just ruling out the items from your side which are not on the other side, okay? Because, because uh, these items are already in place, okay? And then, uh, once we have this, then you can also compute a whole bunch of other statistics which are popular in database land. Um, rarity, distinct elements, size of joins, uh, and so on and so on. And uh, two parties is just to keep things simple. If you have distributed setup, you can do this for multiple parties. Um, but for this talk, I just want to keep things simple. Um, slides and papers about multi-party setup, if you're interested, check them out. So, another application of this line of work is to show that using this basic analysis of, of round versus communication complexity of the set intersection problem, we can also show optimality of a whole bunch of other techniques that people use. And communication complexity turns out to be a really uh, the right tool to use. So we can show optimality of a whole bunch of other data compression methods unconditionally, information theoretically. Um, simultaneous dimension reduction of a bunch of actors. If you want to you know, reduce the dimension of the collection of actors, uh, we can show the overbound for, for the space that you need for that. Approximate nearest neighbor sketches. Um, approximate matrix multiplication sketches, um, sketches for approximating largest entry and matrix products. So in all these applications, you want to design a small sketch that will let you perform some operation with later on. Like you want to compress two matrices so that you can approximately multiply them. Or you want to compress, um, again, two matrices so that you can later recover the largest entry in, in the product of these two matrices. And um, all these kind of problems can be reduced um, to, to the set intersection problem. And the lower bounds imply that this uh, problems cannot be solved better than the kind of techniques that will be out there for them. Uh, joint size estimation in databases is another application uh, where we show an optimal lower bound. Okay. Um, all right, so we don't have too much time left. Uh, but let me just try to skim briefly through the second part, which is uh, actually about the massively parallel algorithms, where we're going to care not just about communication like we did in the first part, but also about this computational aspect of the problem associated with long term. Uh, all right, so I'll probably just introduce the results without going into specific techniques. Uh, we've seen all these before, uh, and uh, before we go into algorithms, I'll need to introduce the model that is uh, currently used to model computation in the cloud. So the way it looks is as follows. Um, imagine you have data. The size of your data is going to be n. So n is the size of your input. And then you went to Amazon EC2 or Google Compute Engine, and you ran a bunch of machines. Um, so typically, what you do is you rent um, as many machines as you need to feed all your data into random access memory. Um, what you need to be able to, to run all your computation in RAM. So M is going to be the number of machines, and S is going to be the space per machine. So these are two key parameters that you use. So you go to um, Amazon EC2, you see how much space is per machine, and you decide to buy um, in our machine so that your data fits in RAM. And we're going to parameterize space um, as a function of n. So it's going to be n to the power of 1 minus epsilon, where epsilon is some parameter between 0 and 1. And, um, and typically, um, I would like to say that you don't want to pay too much. So typically, you don't want to pay more than you need to store your data in RAM. So m times s which is the total RAM that you get in out of your cloud, is going to be roughly order n. So you don't want to have too much overhead. Because right. you're paying, and remember that whenever you're paying uh, for extra machines, you, you're just paying linearly in terms of number of machines. And, and that's quite expensive. 
And so uh, this is called the after picture looks. Uh, you have your input of size n that you put in the cloud. Cloud has its identical machines. Uh, there's going to be m of them. Uh, each one has space s. And then you uh, produce an output in the end of your computation. Um, so typically, the way you do the computation in all these frameworks, like uh, say Hadoop, Hadoop really introduces batch, uh, batch model of computation that is divided into rounds of computation. So the key parameter, given here in red, R, is the number of rounds of computation that you do, right? And if you talk to is they're going to tell you, oh, I can run this computation in 10 rounds of memory, so like two rounds of memory. So uh, so this is that number of rounds that the Hadoop people are talking about. And uh, because our data is really big, on each machine locally, we can't really run much more than a near linear time computation. Like if your computation locally runs in quadratic time in space, or cubic time in, in space in other words, that's really terrible, that's not going to work. So we're going to shoot for nearly linear time computation to make this practical. So from user's perspective, if you're a user, uh, roughly speaking, in terms of total CPU time, you're going to have to wait for S um, to times R. So near linear time means S to the power 1 plus the of 1, but you can ignore this. Think of this as S times R. And uh, another aspect of this model is that um, we're not going to assume any streaming processing on the fly. So whenever these machines exchange information between the rounds, each machine is going to receive at most S bits of information. Right? So if your machine has S space, then between the rounds, it cannot actually compress the data on the fly. So it cannot store more than S stuff coming in. OK. And that means that um, just using a single parameter, which is the number of rounds, we can control both the total user time, the CPU time, and the total communication. Uh, because the total communication is not determined by R, it's going to be at most N times R. Right? So we have total space, which is order N, and the communication in each round is at most order N. So multiplying by R is the most order N R. So this really gives us a very clear objective now. And this is why all these Hadoop people are talking about the number of rounds of MapRed is trying to optimize. Um, if we minimize the number of rounds, then we're optimizing both the communication and the CPU time. And ideally, we want R to be a small constant. You know, if you can finish off your workload in two rounds of MapRed, that's great. If you need more, um, then ideally, it should not be more than some small constant. All right. Um, all right, maybe let me skip this part for a quick. This is the motivation, shows the pictures of you know the inventors of Hadoop and, and Google MapReduce and some previous work. Uh, da -da -dum. Uh, some stuff that I'm not talking about, like Pragle style systems, distributed hash tables are really great. Uh, but we're not talking about this very much. And there are some references to say Roger Malaska's Ullman book, uh, low level implementation details. We're not focusing on this very much. Uh, and um, and yeah, so parallel computation, especially massive distributed computation, is a notoriously difficult territory to approach from a theoretical standpoint. Uh, the first pioneering attempt was made by Valiant, who introduced this box synchronous parallel model that is basically a really, really general model. And um, it captures this model that I just described. Um, but the trouble with that is that it's really so, so general. It has too many parameters, maybe like five parameters and so. So it's really hard to design algorithms for it, for, for this BSP model of Valiant. So if you want to design a sorting algorithm, you have to you know, make sure that it's good in all the five parameters somehow at once. And you know there will always be algorithms that are sort of incomparable. One is better than one parameter, the other is better than the other. And uh, even for sorting, uh, there are some papers, but if you, if you go beyond sorting, uh, there aren't that many papers that actually, you know, uh, design algorithms in BSP model. Um, oh, okay. So, 
So the model that I described is called the Massive Parallel Computation Model. So it's been introduced by some Google people, uh, extended by some other Google people, and uh, in our paper on um, that is here, uh, we further refine it to make it even more close to practice. So a bunch of pros um, from uh, from our perspective. Because first of all, it's inspired by all these modern systems, like the map is right in a bunch of spork, has few parameters. In fact, you know, in the most vanilla version that I just described has one parameter with the number of rounds. The fewer rounds, the better, and that's about it. It's fairly robust because it captures a whole bunch of different frameworks like Hadoop and Spark. Uh, it's fairly easy to implement and analyze. So that was a big advantage of Hadoop. Pretty easy pro program for Hadoop. Uh, Hadoop. Uh, and Apache Spark support full tolerance out of the box. Um, requires some new algorithmic ideas. Um, number of rounds is an information theoretic measure so that we can actually analyze it unconditionally, which is kind of interesting. You know, there is no P versus NP stuff um, involved, no conjectures. You can just figure out, you know, the optimal number of rounds pretty often. Um, and there is one con that did not feel fit on this slide, um, but there is one con. So, um, so, so, so the main drawback is that um, sometimes maybe uh, maybe number of parameters is too few, and uh, maybe you should introduce more parameters. But at uh, uh, at the highest level, this model usually gets some good intuition about what's going on. Okay. All right, so this work was done uh, when it was in the internet at Microsoft Research, uh, and, um, and, and we focused on some specific collection of problems, uh, geometric problems that you can solve in, in this parallel model. And, and we, when we're talking about geometric problems, we always think of them as being given by a geometric graph, that is an implicit graph on a set of geometric points. So imagine you have geometric data, Geometric data comes as n vectors in Rd. So d-dimensional vectors say um, each vector corresponds to a data point, and these are the d features of these data points. Okay? And so we have this clone, and we want to compute something on this collection of data points. Um, so the applications that we have in our paper are minimum spanning tree, which is used for clustering and vision, and minimum cost by traumatic matching that is again used for vision. All right, so um, to give you some examples uh, 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 and basic ideas of what you can possibly compute on this set of points, uh, I'm, I'm going to use two-dimensional pictures. So our points are going to be in two dimensions. D is going to be two. And uh, typically, we think of a certain class of problems as easy. The problems that you can solve in polynomial time in your input sign. And the kind of problems that you learn how to solve in polynomial time in, say, algorithms 101 is a minimum spanning tree problem. Uh, so you have these bunch of points, you want to connect them with the shortest tree. Um, an earth mover distance problem, which is actually known in algorithms 101 as a minimum weight by chromatic matching. Um, so you color your points red and blue. Uh, there is half of them red, half of them blue. And you want to connect them with a matching of the minimum possible length. So this is an example uh, of a solution for this specific instance. And another class of problems we think of as hard problems. Uh, the problems which are known to be NP hard. And uh, there are all these problems which are NP hard to Stein or tree, which is um, you're allowed to introduce extra points to connect your um, set of data points with a tree of the minimum possible cost. And figuring out where to place these points, how to connect, is anti hard. Traveling in salesman, you want to route through the set of points of the minimum possible length, is anti hard even in the Euclidean case. Um, a whole bunch of versions of clustering, k medians, facility location, type stuff, is all NP hard. So here I want to find a collection of centers uh, for three clusters, uh, say k medians. All right, um, but from the parallel perspective, it turns out that these anti-hard problems are actually not super interesting 
because okay, well they hard on one machine, but the best state of the art algorithms that you can possibly run in one machine are already divided in quantum type algorithms. So okay, um, you can easily scale them because you divide in quantum, you sort of divide your problem, you know, between the machines, and then you combine the solutions. I'm not going to go into details, but uh, this is fairly straightforward. So we're not even talking about these problems. But in fact, what we're talking about are all these polynomial time problems, which are considered easy. And we're going to need new theory for them because, well, first of all, we need to parallelize them somehow. And if you look at algorithms 101, a minimum spinning tree construction is very sequential. Mean weight and bicromatic matching is even more sequential. Uh, and so how to parallelize algorithms, a priori is not clear. And also polynomial time algorithms are not exactly satisfactory for us, as I mentioned. We want something that runs near linear time in every machine. Okay, so I'm... Uh, I guess I'll, I'll start wrapping up, but uh, I'll just show you the applications for these problems for computer vision, because uh, this might be of interest to some of you. Um, so minimum spanning tree is, you know, these problems from algorithms 101, but what does it have to do with applications? I actually know, did not know this myself for the longest time, but actually there are some nice applications of minimum spanning tree. So what is to clustering? Imagine you want a hierarchical clustering where for any number k, you can find k clusters. Um, and k is a parameter that you can specify at any time. And you want your clustering to be hierarchical, so it sort of like recursively splits the space. So minimum spin tree is actually a, a fairly good solution for this in certain cases, especially actually for some vision type data, I believe. Um, because you construct k clusters by removing k minus one longest edges of the minimum spanning tree. And uh, this is not just some sort of heuristic that gives you whatever clusters it does, but it gives you connected components of this minimum spanning tree um, so that the minimum distance between two closest clusters is as big as possible. So it's a rigorous objective that is achieved by this approach, and it's called single linkage clustering. Uh, so this is an example from standard algorithms textbook by Kleinberg and Tardash. Um, if I take a minimum spanning tree and remove two longest edges, in this case B and C, then I'm going to end up with these three clusters and among all possible partitions you can imagine into three, three sets of points. If I look at the closest distance between two clusters, in this case um, this is going to be C, the closest distance between two different clusters, because C is less than B and less than A, um, then this is going to be maximized among all possible partitions. Right? So any other partition would have uh, this short distance, in this case C, uh, being, uh, being less. Okay. And uh, single linkage clustering, I believe, is particularly useful if your data has sort of some nice geometric structure. If you want to cluster your data not into some sort of clumps like k-means does, but if your data looks like a set of data points corresponding to, say, some geometric shape, like a road, a river, or something of that kind, and then you're trying to figure out, you know, the connectivity structure uh, of clusters. A cluster is a river, a cluster is a road, something like that. Uh, a really long shape that is fo uh, formed by local connections. Um, then single link clustering is actually pretty good. And some variations of it are pretty good. And key means is like pretty terrible, for example. Right? Um, and, you know, the application to computer vision, uh, to just wrap things up, is um, what is called earth mover distance. And earth mover distance is a uh, nice algorithmic way of comparing two pictures of moving objects, say stars or MRI scans. Um, so, so in this example, say we took a picture of the sky with stars in it. So we took it once, then we waited a while, and we took it again. And as you can see, the stars, they have shifted a bit. I'm not sure if you can say this, but... Um, but yeah, some of these objects on these pictures um, have moved a bit. And then the question is, can we try to identify which object moved to where? So, so that we can match these objects between these two pictures. Right, so for example, there was this thing here, but here it kind of disappeared, it moved, moved over here. But it's kind of try to, hard to figure out by, by just looking at the pictures. Um, 
And the way to do this algorithmically is uh, to compute this earth mover distance, which is minimum caused by chromatic magic. So the first thing you do is you capture all the objects, all everything that we see, think is an object on one of the pictures. So this is a really vanilla approach, you know, you can always uh, make it more refined, but uh, the most vanilla version that uses earth mover distance is this one. So you capture your objects, in this case stars, kind of look like this, uh, on both pictures, and you put them together on the same, um, on the same plane, and, and you see that if I compute a minimum cost, minimum length matching, that's going to give me a fairly good idea of what might have happened here. Right? Um, so, so these two objects, these two objects are the same, and this one is probably a copy um, of the star that. Okay, so that's the idea behind uh, behind Earth mover distance for, for image matching. All right, so I'm not going to go into any technical details. Do, 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 do. Uh, bum, bum, bum. All right. All right. To wrap things up, you know, just ask me questions. This is great. Thank you. Um, so some folks probably have to go to get the class at four. Uh, so feel free to to go ahead. Including me, who has shoot four. Oh my, okay. <laughs> All right, so we have time for maybe one question. Anyone have a super quick question? Cool. Uh, so when you say like rounds of communication, is it, is it, is it like an abstract round of communication? Like is it like, I'm not sure. Oh, it's, it's actually very well defined. You know, when I'm talking to you, okay. and then you're talking to me, then we have two rounds, right? But then you talk to me again, it's the third round, and so on. So but what if we say the same thing to each other? Then it's effectively one round. So it's a number of alternations between us talking that matters, right? And what we say is irrelevant. Does that make sense, right? Maybe I'm just thinking it's wrong, but... It's a number of alternations, say I talk, then you talk, right. and I talk, no. and how many times we alternate, this one. I mean, like, right. but, if, if, but if I were to send you the same hash twice, that wouldn't really accomplish anything, right? Right, so the algorithms don't actually do that, right? So the algorithms are more clever. And okay, whenever right. I talk to you, I don't repeat the same thing again. Right, okay, yeah, okay, that's right. a good question. Okay, all right, yeah. that makes sense. All right. All right, we mm. better let you get to, to class. But <laughs> if folks have uh, questions, they should follow up with uh, Gregory uh, mm -hmm. later. Your, your class probably isn't in this building, right? No, it's not. It's Valentine. Okay, yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> better let you go. But thank you so much for the Oh, sure. It was really great. Yeah. Talk. Thanks. Yeah.